mean, Vitalik's talk was called Crypto Economics in 30 Minutes. So I was like, oh, maybe I should call this talk Ethereum Foundation Prioritization Framework Allocation Philosophy and Decision Making Guidance in 30 Minutes. Uh, but it just didn't quite have the same ring to it. So welcome to Subtraction in Action. But really, it's Ethereum Foundation Prioritization Framework Allocation Philosophy and Decision Making Guidance in 30 Minutes. Um, so like I said, I'm Albert. I spend most of my time these days helping the EF wherever I can. Um, I've been a fan of Ethereum since way back before even the DAO fork, uh, but needless to say, a, a lot has changed. And one of the most important things that has changed is that the EF has become one small part of a big, vibrant Ethereum ecosystem. And that's not just good, it's, I think it's essential for Ethereum to thrive long term. One reason is because, you know, when it comes to the future, we are all like this parable that I love and I just use in every talk, which is the blind men and the elephant. Uh, so most of you have probably heard this parable, you have blind men, they're feeling different parts of an elephant for whatever reason. Uh, they each get an incomplete picture out of this. You know, they make different and incorrect assumptions about what they're touching. Um, I find this to be a really, like, even though I have no idea why the blind men are doing this, I find this to be really valuable because in the real world there's a lot of situations that are analogous to this. In the real world there's a lot of situations where we don't see the full picture of something, including Ethereum. I mean, even right now, you have this like new critique that no one can say what Ethereum is, you know? It's like, is it this or is it that? And so if we're having this much trouble describing what Ethereum is today, well, you know, one can only imagine how hard it is to see the picture of what Ethereum is going to be in five years. So, you know, since I went through all the trouble making this, this animation, I figured I'd use it twice. So you know, here we have Ethereum in 2019, and then... Ethereum in, in 2024, and, and this is not a price prediction. It might be a state size prediction, I'm just kidding. But uh, it, it is an impact goal, right, for, for Ethereum. You know, for everybody who's in one of the Ethereum communities today, there are a lot of people, 100, probably more than that, still to join. And something that Aya talked about in her talk was how this independent flourishing that we have, this vast, vibrant ecosystem, this makes Ethereum special. This is key to us growing into this 2024 uh, potential. So one of my favorite books from this book, or fun, one of my favorite quotes from one of my favorite books, titled Good Strategy, Bad Strategy, uh, you can read the quote, but it, it essentially says that, you know, life doesn't work like the movies. It, in, in the movies, the hero has this like crazy elaborate plan. You know, sometimes they manage to dodge a bullet by like a few inches, and they never show what happens in the movie if they didn't manage to dodge the bullet. And the real world doesn't work that way. In the real world, it's more important to have, create options and to have flexibility than to have this like master 12-step plan. And so when I think about the ability to create options, I'll take what was said by Aya a step further. I think what we have here in the Ethereum ecosystem isn't just what makes it special. I think it's an outright superpower. And so one of the things that we've been trying to explain better is that this, this like subtraction mindset, you know, it's about creating options, it's about leveraging unfair advantages, and it also recognizes and embraces that there's this unique opportunity and responsibility in Ethereum. One thing that I think is important to note is it's not even like everyone, I think, can effectively apply the, the subtraction mindset. And another thing that I want to note is that this is not the EF claiming, hey, everyone has to operate this way, but we do think that it's crucial to the EF's future operations so that it can like, fulfill its responsibilities and its potential as a steward and supporter of Ethereum. So uh, some of you, a lot of you have probably seen it now, especially after Aya's talk, but I'll just do a really quick speed review of some of the aspects of the subtraction mindset. Um, you know, you have this like whole in an addition mindset, you're trying to capture opportunities. In a subtraction mindset, you're trying to distribute them. Um, I think that this contrast between trying to increase prestige and increase effectiveness is very interesting. Uh, for instance, universities don't seek to grow, you know, in terms of number of personnel or things like that necessarily, but every university cares about its prestige, and, and one could argue that it has come at the cost of the effectiveness uh, over time. You know, the basic one that I really like is just what do you think when other people, other organizations, you know, create value? And uh, I honestly, I, I really just did a speed review just so I could reuse this slide because I love it so much. It's from this, uh, it's a fictional quote, but I think it actually <laughs> says, you know, like, like many good fictional quotes, it says uh, something really crisp about the real world. Um, 
And so, you know, this is obviously not the mindset that we are taking at the EF. And, and so ultimately, it's not that the point is that the EF needs, like, is trying to uh, avoid responsibility or, you know, do all this other stuff. It's just noting that what matters most here is Ethereum and how much the Ethereum Foundation matters, that, that's kind of secondary or hopefully in service to Ethereum. So that's nice, um, but why is this so tricky? Because, you know, every organization cares about just doing the right things or being impactful or, or whatever. And it took, I think, at least for me, it took a while to better understand uh, and articulate the challenge. So on the one hand, obviously, you know, what we do matters, right? And there's like, and there's all these direct consequences to what we do. But how we do things also really matters. This is true everywhere, but I think when you have an organization with the history of the Ethereum Foundation, and you have something like Ethereum that is itself unprecedented, then this like how things are done, the, and the second order effects, or, or the indirect consequences of what is done, that also really matters. It, it often matters more. And so when we talk about doing what's best for Ethereum, it's like, okay, of course we want to do that, but then the tensions arise. For example, some short term versus long term. This isn't just an Ethereum specific thing, and all kinds of organizations uh, face challenges around this. Um, they're setting direction, but then on the other hand, you have this like huge ecosystem, and, and does that curtail creativity? Similarly, you know, coordination is often extremely valuable to do something, but of course, decentralization is this hedge against a lot of the bad things that can happen in the world. How do those play off each other? And even something like I think that is often overlooked, which is, you know, when you endorse something, it, it also might come with a chilling effect because, it, if, for example, the EF says, "Hey, look, this project, we're supporting them," then someone else might be like, "Well, I'm not going to work on something that does something similar." because you know, this other project's already being endorsed by the EF. So that's not saying there's no, no way around that, but how you go about doing an endorsement, how you go about doing those things uh, also matters. So to try to like at least make it a little simpler, I, at a very high level, the EF today is focused on two complementary goals. There's, there's working towards this world where Ethereum is widely used, hopefully for good, and also trying to build towards a world where Ethereum values are widely found. And like, in this talk, I won't have enough time to, to say like what is used for good necessarily mean or what the Ethereum values are. And those are extraordinarily important, and I'm not trying to like sweep it aside, but it's really also not my place to say or our place to say. Um, but I do think that like it obviously merits discussion, and that we can also agree that in theory there is some version of widespread good use of Ethereum and some version of you know widespread Ethereum values that would be desirable. So figuring that out. If this wasn't complicated enough, figuring that out is also something that we want to work on. To like make it a little shorter, we've got grow Ethereum usage and you know spread Ethereum values. And to, to dive into these a little bit, uh, for me at least, grow usage is really this like shorthand way of talking about measurables. Um, it's not just about like transactions on chain or unique addresses or things like that. Uh, not you know. Not everything can be quantified that easily, but some measurements can still help us calibrate. Uh, and I think another thing to note is that it's, we can be a lot more systematic about this at times. You don't have to be like extremely precise. Like I, I don't know what the exact number is, but I think it's, it's got to be like 99.5% of software developers either have not done anything with Ethereum or are not like actively you know, working on Ethereum. I don't need to know what that exact number is. I can tell you that anything that can plausibly increase the rate at which we can penetrate that market is probably worth exploring. Similarly, you know, spread values is a, is a shorthand way of saying that there are things that matter that cannot be easily quantified. And as I alluded to earlier, I expect and seek enormous debate over what the quote value should be. Like I said, it's not for the EF to decide alone. And I think it's actually one of the reasons why a subtraction mindset is so important. Because you know, maybe to folks in this room, you, it's obvious that you wouldn't want to do this, but we have people all the time who are like telling us, you should just say exactly what your values are and tell everyone how they should be operating in, in your ecosystem. Um, but yeah, really the most important part of here is that this, this like hard to quantify stuff is just as important. I think it might even be more important than the quantifiable stuff. And just some quick examples. I think just even just the example that uh, Ethereum sets for others, you know, being an inspiration. I know that for me personally, seeing a different way of operating as a community than say like 
the, the Bitcoin community was operating uh, several years ago was, was very attractive to me. And, and things like this are not going to be adequately captured by stats. Um, there's also things that we have to be wary of compromising on, right? Like Ethereum becomes more centralized, you know, let's say it partners with projects or companies or governments to get, quote, more usage, then maybe it's still called Ethereum, but I'm not sure that it's still Ethereum that's being used. And so to tie it back to what I was talking about earlier, you can look at it as usage being primarily about first order, you know, effects, direct consequences, and, and values being about like second order effects or indirect consequences. And so as I noted earlier, the subtraction mindset creates options. It leverages unfair advantages and it embraces this like unique opportunity and responsibility. Another thing that I think has really shaped the way we think about things at the EF is observing that this amazing ecosystem is now at a point where it seems like 90% of what Ethereum needs happens organically. And a lot of it happens better than, than quote, central planning alone would lead to. But there's still definitely at least a 10% that could benefit from additional coordination or direction um, or accountability. And so we take this like first order effect lens, naturally you'd want to identify this, this 10%. Um, you know, Ethereum is a normal company, but uh, I think Amin said this to me and I really liked it. it. You also don't want it to fail in ways that like any normal company never would. Now, on the second order effect lens, there's how you go about approaching this, right? So we prefer approaches that would move things in this like 10% bucket to the 90%. Move it from insufficient coordination, for instance, to like organic flourishing. And so I've been calling this the, the 10 to 90 philosophy. So mapping back to a slide from Aya's talk, you know, she referenced you know, incubation, community support, and going beyond Ethereum is like three of the many classes of support we're trying to provide. And I think looking more closely, especially at these particular examples, Almost all of them are examples of this 10 to 90 philosophy in action. Some other examples include just this general increased emphasis on ecosystem support that some of you heard about uh, and will be continuing to communicate more about. Um, something I mentioned a bit earlier, but there's a chilling effect when you have a quote official project or even just when you give a grant to something or when you partner with something. And so that doesn't mean you never do that, but I think recognizing that this effect exists is important to determine the best ways to really support the outcomes we're trying to achieve. <laughs> Another one is just biasing towards being commonly collaborative. You know, I'm not gonna, the EF is a very decentralized organization in spite of what some might say. I'm not gonna sit here and say that when I first saw, for instance, some of the sponsors for DEF CON, I was like, oh, that makes perfect sense. Like, you have all these competitors, you have all these other things. Um, but I think what's, what's really interesting is, it, for me, one of the things that drew me to Ethereum is, well, if you operate in a way that everyone operated that way, like, you know, does that make the world a better place? And Ethereum seemed to be this environment that kind of most uh, gave the opportunity to express that. And I think being uncommonly collaborative, not blindly or naively, but at least uncommonly collaborative, is a really important part of making it possible for things to, you know, move 10 to 90. So all this you know, ties into the support stuff that I has been talking about and uh, improving our support capabilities is like, obviously how well we allocate is a huge part of that. And so you know, sometimes I think about it, it's like, yeah, you just figure out what to allocate towards, how hard can that be? Um, and then when I sit down and I try to think about it more and I talk with all the people throughout the ecosystem, well, here's just like an incomplete list of needs when we talk about Ethereum over the next five years, right? Like obviously we'd like to see you know, usage grow um, with that, there's community growth that's important to cultivate. Developer base needs to grow. Uh, and then developer output, you know, it's just not just quantity, but like what each developer is capable of doing, which is, which is very different and very important. Of course, researcher base is still going to be important. Researchers are, often produce things that, you know, enable developers to be much, much more effective. And broadly speaking, we also just need to support the research. You can't just grow the researcher base, but you also need to find ways to support these researchers that are building uh, towards Ethereum tomorrow. Similarly, there's a ton of development going into the future of Ethereum. And while we're talking about future, we can't forget that there's also an Ethereum today. And the security and upkeep of Ethereum today, which I think does get a little bit overlooked at times, is equally as important. And an extension of security and upkeep is just this notion of downside protection, right? Like, 
there, there are still many things that can happen that can single-handedly set back or destroy all that we've built and worked towards. Um, but then the flip side of downside protection is this general notion of out-of-the-box ideas. Right? I think if we get too locked into precisely defined categories, we're going to lose a lot of the essence that made Ethereum. You know, Ethereum itself was an out-of-the-box idea in the first place. And of course, you know, I haven't even, I don't think I covered everything, but, but before I forget, there's also, it's important to support everything in a way that's consistent or whatever that's even going to mean with Ethereum's values. Um, so, yeah, take a look at all, all that and also tell me what I've missed, because I'm sure I have, or tell me how you would break these things down further. Um, and this is a big part of what, not just we at the EF, but we, you know, it's an Ethereum ecosystem have to do together. So, yeah, my response to this is, well, we don't have any choice, so challenge accepted. Um, and so, in order to do all of these things, like, what is it going to take? Well, first, I want to talk a little bit about what mediocre decision making looks like. Because I think, like, sometimes making less mistakes uh, is just as important as having more hits. Often it's much easier to prevent than to fix. Uh, you know, fixing gets you glory and prevention doesn't. I think that's one of the reasons we know and maybe notice it as much. But prevention is also extremely important. And so in light of that, I'll start with some common patterns that we try to avoid. There's you know, wishful thinking, um, confirmation or narrative bias, just like a general lack of nuance, like sometimes when you just infinitely weight one thing uh, in lieu of everything else. And of course, just pattern matching in general, especially since like, if you don't really know why the pattern that you are matching like maybe makes sense to be matched, uh, then it might very well be coincidental. So these are just some uh, you know basic things to keep in mind, easier said than done, but something that we try to keep in mind with everything. So now I want to talk a little bit about how we would, for instance, evaluate an allocation proposal. Um, there's a few big components here. One is to precisely identify the goals. Another is to think holistically, you know, independent of the proposal about what are the best ways to achieve the goals. And then there's, you know, evaluating the proposal itself. So, we've got those steps here. Um, so, coming back briefly to Aya's presentation, in it she showed some of the things that the Ethereum Foundation has been supporting. And just to quickly run through them again, we had grantees, you know, we had these other support designations, um, and then these additional areas, which I also showed earlier when I was talking about the 10 to 90. Um, I obviously wouldn't have time to go into each and every one of them, but I did think that what might be helpful is to kind of do a case study uh, of what allocation looks like in practice. Um, because what's important is not like to be able to uh, justify a mediocre decision, it's just to make a good decision. And so we can talk about theory and framework all day, but let's see like what happens when you really put it into practice. And to illustrate this, uh, I chose a particularly interesting allocation story from this past year. This was definitely like way more elaborate than most. I want to emphasize that it's not like everything needs to go through all the stuff that happened here, um, because again, the goal is not to produce better justifications. It's actually just to make better decisions as often as possible. That often requires incomplete information, uh, yeah, operating with incomplete information. But I chose this story because I think it just illustrates so many of the things that I've been talking about in a way that hopefully makes it more tangible. So, what was the catalyst? Uh, we learned that a popular Ethereum developer who's doing great work is looking for funding support. Now, this wasn't even a direct application, by the way. It wasn't like this, there was an application of the grants program or the EF. It's just something that, that we were paying, noticing and paying attention to. Um, and, and I should be clear that this actually happens quite a bit. This is a very dynamic space. There's people moving around all the time, doing lots of people doing great work. And the EF is often making introductions, exploring grant opportunities and so on with such people. And at the same time, the EF, uh, it can't and, and probably shouldn't react every single time something like this comes up. But this particular situation caught our eye. Uh, the work that this person had been doing had been contributing to onboarding more people to Ethereum uh, and an effect on improving Ethereum UX. And so we thought it, maybe it does make sense to give them more freedom. Uh, let's uh, break this down. Now remember, I mentioned precisely uh, identifying goals. And what I said here about you know, onboarding or improving UX or giving more freedom, I, I don't think that's precise enough. So let's try to go deeper. When we talk about onboarding more people to Ethereum, you know, why do we want to do that? And 
One obvious reason is we think this is going to lead to more Ethereum usage. But of course, an important implication of that is that people will continue finding Ethereum useful and, and not just one and done. So you're not just looking for like a gimmick to onboard somebody, right? You're actually looking for a sustainable like outcome. Another reason might just be that like when you onboard people to Ethereum, the, the people themselves might be developers, and you know maybe those developer they become an Ethereum developer, and then maybe that Ethereum developer then creates new cases, and you know the cycle kind of starts where it begins. Uh, and there's many other possible reasons. Similarly, with uh, Ethereum UX, right? Like when we talk about Ethereum improving Ethereum user experience, you know for what impact? Uh, is it maybe increased accessibility? Uh, maybe that increased accessibility leads to increase user growth. Maybe increased uh, security, like less user error. And just in general, like I think products are more useful when the UX is better. And of course, there's so many other reasons why improving UX would be good. Lastly, for, for this whole give more freedom, well, there was this hypothesis that it would lead them to be more impactful on Ethereum via increased contributions to you know, the onboarding that I mentioned, the UX stuff that I mentioned, and perhaps also other stuff. We shouldn't restrict to like what their work had been doing so far when there was evidence that they were doing lots of good work. One thing I think is really cool here is not I think, obvious at all who this is because there's so many people in the ecosystem that fit a lot of these attributes. So moving forward, step two, holistically, like how can we best achieve these goals? And I think this is a really uh, important step that often gets skipped. I think oftentimes we jump too quickly to like providing an answer when instead we should be improving the question that's being asked. You know, out of the box ideas uh, often come from the question prompted by better questions, not just directly answering a question. So, what is onboarding? For onboarding more people to Ethereum, right? Like these are all these reasons I listed out earlier, but breaking it down, the, I think the more questions that we want to ask are, what are the best ways to grow Ethereum usage? Or what are the best ways to grow the developer base? Or what are the best ways to create more use cases? And similarly with UX, you know, we talked about these things, increasing accessibility, security, usefulness. But breaking that down, where do we need to most increase accessibility? What are the best ways, again, to grow the usage? Um, in what ways do we most need to improve security uh, or just decrease user error, which might not be strictly a security thing? Um, how can we improve Ethereum's usefulness in general? And of course, how can we make Ethereum products, whatever that even might mean, easier to use? And then finally, we have to give this person more freedom. Well, like we thought it might increase their impact. So what would the best ways to improve the onboarding like in general be, whether it involves this person or not, and same with UX. But then also with the person, you know, what type of environment would help them be most impactful? Like is there guidance or mentorship and obviously financial support that would enable them to do their best work? And so off of one situation, I easily come up with 20 goals that are potentially uh, worth pursuing. And at a meta level, it's clear that increasing ES ability to provide support is going to be necessary uh, to be able to be able to just work on more of these goals. Um, and then another thing that's really important is that if you want to improve your allocations, a big part of that is actually improving what opportunities you have to allocate. Right? If, if, sometimes you have these options in front of you, but if you can create more options, that's often the best way to like, you know, be able to make a better decision. So earlier I talked about evaluating an allocation proposal, but there's kind of this like analog, which is to create an allocation opportunity. And, and you do that, like, it's still very similar to evaluating a proposal, but for instance, inviting and seeking out proposals is obviously a very different step than evaluating them. Now remember, I, I showed this slide just a moment ago about how jumping too quickly, and I actually skipped over one extremely important question uh, that should be asked. Remember, we started with this, we have a popular Ethereum developer doing great work, and, and so another question that should be asked is how do we increase the amount of great work being done in the space? And that's already such a huge question, so just to keep this a, like, a little bit simpler, I'm going to focus on how do we increase the great work being done by developers, even though you know, by no means is that the only category of work that's important. So there's some dimensions here. It'd be nice to increase the number of developers you know, by improving evangelism, onboarding, and retention. 
There's also, it'd be nice to improve productivity per developer via like tooling, education, or even just like uh, this market, like implicit market that exists for mentorship and collaboration opportunities, right? Like, like sometimes you thrive in the right company, but if you can't discover that company, then you know, you're never gonna have a chance to thrive. So what we did to work on this was uh, we formed uh, a few working groups. And these working groups did the following things in parallel. They identified uh, potential goals that we should focus on ASAP, and they also performed deeper investigation of the topics, you know, just general research, uh, interviewing people, and even asking experts outside of the Ethereum ecosystem. So when it came to goals to focus on uh, ASAP, among other things, for developer onboarding, we worked on studio.ethereum.org. Uh, thank you to the Superblocks team who helped out with that, and you know, I think in less than a couple of weeks now, that's going to be, be live. And uh, on the developer experience side, there were so many things, but I think one of the most notable ones that came out very recently was, was Bibbler stack traces by the Nomic Labs team. Furthermore, you know, this deeper research uh, on developer experience, it led us to seek out like developers who themselves are experienced with Ethereum, are passionate about DevX, and have the bandwidth uh, to help, or you know, maybe can, we can help them create the bandwidth to help. And so, for instance, as I mentioned, uh, the Bidler stack traces, you know, we've been collaborating a lot more with the Nomic Labs team, Nomic Labs team, and with them and with a lot of other folks throughout the EF have been identifying a whole suite of developer experience improvement opportunities that maybe we can go 10 to 90 in terms of improving. So also from an Ethereum value standpoint, this is cool because uh, we're continuing to support in the ecosystem rather than you know, trying to do things entirely in-house, and I think that is a huge part of everything here. Another interesting aspect was this developer evangelism research, right? You know, I kind of wrote it all up there, but we connected with a lot of the best developer evangelists in the world, and these conversations confirmed like the value of having great developer evangelism, um, and it also taught us a lot about what that might mean. But we, in addition, learned how hard it might be to hire people for this. Um, so what's interesting here is like you know the best not only are the best developer evangelists extremely hard to poach because they're often extremely valued. Uh, but they also might not be great at being Ethereum evangelists anyway, right? Because Ethereum is quite different than a lot of the other development stacks out there. So how does this all like tie together? Remember, this all started with a popular Ethereum developer doing great work. And, you know, we were thinking about what it might, like we were trying to assess the different goals, and one question we asked was, is there an environment that they could be more impactful in? What type of guidance you know, or mentorship uh, would enable them to do their best work? Um, that also led to us thinking about how do we increase the amount of great work being done, which, you know, this whole value of developer evangelism, in addition, finding out how hard it is to hire for that. So, you might even have noticed earlier, if you're eagle-eyed, developer evangelism program was kind of buried in this, like, incubation section that, uh, that Aya showed and I've showed a few times here. So, putting all this together, we are now working on starting a developer evangelism program. Um, you know, and on the back end, we have, you know, Robbie Bennett and myself and the EF, other folks uh, from this developer evangelism working group. And on the front end, you know, popular uh, Ethereum developer doing great work, you know, we learned this particular person here was Austin Griffith, who many of you know worked on the burner wallet and all kinds of other things. And this was really cool, I think, to, when I think about how all this came together. I think it's really, like, we're gonna to work together with Austin to build out this program. We're gonna be able to leverage his passion and enthusiasm for evangelizing Ethereum. And I think it's just really fitting that we start with one of the most kind, authentic, passionate, and prolific builders in Ethereum. You know, when we were talking to these various dev evangelists, a lot of them weren't really builders at heart. They were actually more like evangelists at heart who happened to be able to build. And, and for Ethereum, it didn't feel right to have anyone other than like someone who's just first and foremost a builder. And if anyone here knows Austin, you know that's like, all he can do. I think like the birth of his child is literally the only thing that ever stops him and even then it's for like 36 hours or something. Um, so anyway, to wrap everything up here, uh, we've gone you know, from the top kind of all the way down and I'll close by zooming back out. Uh, Ethereum is gonna have enormous direct consequences um, and perhaps even more enormous indirect consequences. So we have a long way to go, and because of that, one of my favorite quotes is to hold tightly to the problems, um, but loosely uh, to the solutions. For us, right now it seems that becoming more flexible, dynamic, and capable at providing support 
that's the best way that the EF can you know, practice the subtraction discipline. Um, but as I said, hold loosely to the solutions. Like, hopefully as a result of this talk, you'll both better understand our reasoning, and more importantly, be able to give us feedback. So, thank you everyone for coming to talk. Hope you've been enjoying DevCon.